Hey everyone, welcome to the Naughty Shaman Podcast. I'm your host, Natalie Carlisle, and I can't wait to dive in to a world where the sacred meets the wild and keeps things totally real. In each episode, we are going to dive in to what it truly means to live a radiant life that is unapologetically real. And if you're ready to get started, so am I. Hello, everybody. It is Natalie Carlisle, and welcome to the Naughty Shaman Podcast. I'm so excited to be sharing with you uh, another episode in the series of Doing My Dharma. And when I was thinking of people to invite, Ashanti Wood was at the top of the list because her transformational journey has been one that I think a lot of people that are listening will be able to relate to. There was a time in Ashanti's life, and I'll let her share the stories, when things, as she looked into the future, looked a little dark and bleary. Bleary? I feel like that should be a work, a word. But um, And then she did the work and made this commitment and made these choices. And now Ashanti is just kicking so much ass out there, following her dharma, started a business called Soul Happy. I mean, who doesn't want to be part of that? And she's doing sound healing and shamanic work and yoga and just transforming lives in a lot of different fields. And so I just want to welcome you, Ashanti. I'm so glad that you're here today joining us. I'm so happy. Thank you for having me. Oh, my pleasure. My pleasure. You know, I was thinking about this podcast and I was thinking, I don't even remember when I met Ashanti. I can't remember if you were twirling fire. Like, what What was this? Like, I yep. can't remember the exact moment. Do you remember? That was, that was the first time I met you. Yeah. I, I had <laughs> gone to the, the center when you still had it. Um, yep. last year. I had gone there, um, I think maybe like a year or a couple months prior to that. Um, but I don't think you were there that day. Um, okay. and yeah, I met you at the fire ceremony. I was the one twirling fire. <laughs> I feel like I came over to you and was like, what magic is this? I want to learn how to do that. Is I that did, you right? my wand for you to try and you were like twirling <laughs> around and everything. I remember that. That was amazing. Unicorn Meadows. I think we're at Unicorn yep. Meadows. Mm -hmm. Oh my gosh, we're going to be back there for the solstice fire. Did you know that? The summer solstice. We're going to be back I at Unicorn Meadows. I'm so excited. <laughs> Oh my gosh. So yeah, that was kind of the beginning of our journey. And, um, and I know now you're just kicking ass and teaching in Dharma school and offering sound healings and mentoring and doing lots of different things with your own private clients. But, but I know that's not where you started. And I wonder if you just want to share a little bit about what took you, what was happening in your life that took you deeper into your spiritual healing journey? Um, well, I think growing up and just like all through my life, I really can't think of a time that there just wasn't this like overlay of just like sadness and depression and anger, so much anger. And I think what really finally shifted me and started my own journey was moving away from home. Yeah. Um, I think I needed to to go off on my own and kind of do my own thing away from where, you know, so much of that had kind of come from. So <laughs> and, much of the pain and, and yeah. depression and stuff like that. Okay. And, got yeah, so it. Got it. Like so you this. left home. Mm -hmm. And um, once I was kind of out of my own, I mean, it was, it was a little bit of like a breath of fresh air because it was like, okay, like, it's a new place to start from. Nobody knows me. And, you know, there's just this kind of space for me to explore. Mm -hmm. um, but at the same time, it was also almost worse in some ways because I was alone. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I couldn't really escape, you know, those moments where like depression set in really deep because I just sit in my apartment by myself. So it was like both this good and awful experience, but it really pushed me in ways to continue to, to heal because I just right. didn't want to feel that way anymore. Oh my gosh. God. So how old were you when all this was going on? You left home and moved into a apartment um, by yourself. I can't remember if I was, I think I had just turned 20 maybe. Oh my gosh. Yeah. I think, you're a yeah. puppy. You were just a babe. <laughs> wee babe. 
a wee bairn. Wow. Yeah, that's young. And I'll tell you what, you know, I, I know you and I have talked about this a little bit, but I'm not a stranger to depression and depression is a monster when people are dealing with it. Uh, you know, a lot of people mistake, I think, I don't know. I'd love your thoughts on this. I think a lot of people mistake depression as a sadness, but it's not emotional. It's almost, it's hugely energetic in my experience and just feels like all of the life force kind of pours out of you and there's no will to make anything happen. It's like the will not to die or live. I don't know. There's like a gray area in there in depression and it gets pretty dark and twisty um, when you're kind of down in that, that place of depression. So I don't know what it was like for you, but I, I would be interested because you know, I think a lot of it, it's hugely energetic what we face. But anyway, yeah. What was your experience? Like? Yeah, I, I definitely agree. Cause like, I, I can definitely say sadness isn't only the definition of depression, of depression. Um, yeah. and it was, <laughs> um, definitely something I don't think I realized I was completely in, like it was just the way I existed. Um, right. like it's now, like normal. Yeah. So like now when I look back, I'm like, oh my God, like when I look back at some of like my writing or, you know, just looking yeah. at how I lived and certain things I did, I remember at certain points in my life, like I would be in my apartment and I would take everything that represented me off the walls, off the dressers, like everything. And I'd put it in a box and just put it in the closet. Like I didn't even want to see my existence in my own space. And I would sit there for hours with that and just my empty apartment. And then, you know, even though I don't really, I didn't realize it at the time, but now when I look back, like those moments where I was just like, all right, let's do it again. Let's try, you know, that was like really me believing myself, but I would take the stuff out of the, out of the um, closet and I would put it all back and, but I would do that multiple times. Like I just didn't even want to see myself anywhere. <laughs> wow. Wow. Did you and your, your healing, so I hear like, it sounds like there's something inside you that was like, don't do this. There's maybe like a little whisper of a voice. And, you know, we have those little whispers inside where our soul is willing to fight for us. And I praise you and congratulate you for listening to that wee voice, because I think so many people either don't know they have that voice or they don't listen or they don't hear it. And so beautiful, you know, it's interesting, like, what do you think, what did you learn about those moments when you would take, that sounds so powerful. Like you took all the things that reminded you about yourself off the wall. Did you gain any insight? Like, what was that about for you? Um, I think it was a way to, for me to feel like I didn't exist. Um, wow. cause I just, I, I hated everything at that time it just nothing made me happy everything was so hard and it was definitely a battle of the voices i think um <laughs> which voices <laughs> yeah. so um like there was that voice that would just constantly be in my head and tell me like i wasn't good enough and this is pointless and you're worthless and you don't matter and everything you do fails and what's the point and nobody likes you and you're a freak mm -hmm. and you're a weirdo and all of these mm -hmm. things yeah. and now when i look back at the moments that became really amazing parts of my healing journey um and i, I finally just decided to go with that gut feeling of just go for it and I realized that that gut feeling of, you know, telling myself to get the stuff out of the box or telling myself, go do that training or what have you was like, my gut was calling to me and it was like me calling to me mm. um, rather than the voice that was constantly trying to put me down. Um, so it was, it was definitely a challenging, very challenging experience to have. Um, I remember the, t the point where I really just decided one way or another. Um, it, I remember being in my apartment at the time and I made a video, like a goodbye video. Um, wow. And, you know, I didn't know when or if I was going to use it, but I was getting so, so tired. And I was like, okay, here are my two choices right now. 
we use that video at some point or we try another way. <laughs> and that other way was me finally just saying, I'm done with the, I should do this and I should, I'm supposed to do that and this and that, because that's what I did all my life was try to do the things that I was supposed to do, go to college, do this, wear that, be this kind of person, all the shoulds and the shoulds weren't working. And I was just like, I'm just going to listen to my gut. And literally, I think about like a month after that is I saw an ad on Facebook for a yoga training and I did no research on this. I literally just paid, went to Thailand, <laughs> totally scammed. Um, to Thailand? Oh my gosh. But that kind of set it off because that I then, while I was there, I got introduced to sound healing. And then, you know, after I did my training, not immediately after, but I got into the sound and that was another just gut feeling, go for it. And same with Dharma. It was just, you know, I, I finally said, yes to one of those paths and you know going with my gut was was great oh my god it, it sounds like it potentially saved your life in a way oh absolutely absolutely <laughs> where do you think you found the courage to say i'm doing it this way now like that's huge i i guess it was just like you know i finally I was finally at that fork in the road, like, you know, all those, yep. you know, times of just being super sad and depressed and crying and being alone and all these other things. And finally, it was just like, you are here. Like you have literally brought yourself to the point of making a video to say goodbye. Like you feel like this much shit. Yeah. <laughs> you can't feel any worse if you try something else. Oh, <laughs> so love that. Gave it a try and it, and it I, I, can only say this first time in my life, I can say like, I'm, I'm happy. I'm so happy. <laughs> oh my God. That is so, and it shows like it shows yeah. in what you're creating in your life and how you interact with people. I'm sure it's showing in your relationships and everywhere. So what started to turn the bend? So, so yoga in Thailand, falling in love with sound healing. Like what was it that was kind of happening inside of you that was making the transformations um, yeah, I know there were thousands of them probably along the way, right? But <laughs> um, I think with with first going and going to the training and doing yoga, like that was the first thing I truly did for me. Yeah. Um, you know, because it was just like, who the hell goes across the world to Thailand for a yoga teacher training? Like, you know, that was definitely outside of my world of, you know, what you should be doing. Right. And I did it and it was amazing. And I felt so courageous because I went there by myself, had no idea where I was or what I was doing. And through yoga kind of helped me to feel more connected to my body, which was a hard thing for me. And I always had a lot of issues with my body. Mm -hmm. And so that gave me that moment to just reconnect with it um, mm -hmm. and find love there for it. And then when um, I then later did my sound training that helped me so much to find some peace in my mind um, because yeah. that was always such a scary place for me. Mm -hmm. um, and now that I look back, I guess we kind of almost journeyed to the garden and sound just call it like your soundscape, but oh, it created a space in your mind where it's like you're overwhelmed, things are happening go back into that place you've created yourself. And it created a safe space in all the chaos that was my mind. Wow. And I think that then, you know, for me personally, I think I needed those two steps before going into Dharma. And mm -hmm. um, that I think was finally the thing that like pushed me over the edge of my healing journey because that really mm -hmm. helped me to understand myself more and, yeah. Um, I really needed that. I needed to really just figure out why am I feeling this way? What has been holding me back? What are the things that, you know, I didn't even know were there. And um, that, that really made a change. That is awesome. You know, you said two things that made my whisker switch. I was like, damn, that feels important. Like you said, you felt, began to feel safe in your body and in your mind. And that those were sort of foundational or necessary before even taking 
an even deeper dive, you know, into or into other worlds. I think there are a lot of people, I don't know, don't you? I feel like there are a lot of people that are really out of right relationship with their physical body or their physical reality. Um, I don't know. Like, what do you see? Because you're a yoga teacher. I know you see this a lot. Like, what do you see in general? Absolutely. I definitely have seen that in my classes. You know, people are are very disconnected to their body. You know, you'll tell them to like, you know, raise their arm up and they don't even know how to really like what, where, where am I going kind of thing. And um you know, we're just, I think our lives are so crazy that we're just going from here to there and this and work and getting up and going. And, you know, you kind of lose that detachment. I think if you've had moments of like trauma or, you know, you have that depression, you have all these things going on, you know, the world doesn't seem, feel safe outside of you and you don't feel safe inside of yourself. So to try, I think for me, um, to, to deal with all of that, the, the pain I needed, mm-hmm. I needed some safety mm-hmm. and that had to start with me. Yeah. I feel it. It sounds like yoga gave you a structure to kind of feel that safety in your body. Did you say that was kind of where that all started for you? Yeah, I think so. Cause I mean, um, I remember my first little like dive into yoga was actually my high school had a yoga club and I just joined it because that was really my only time to like do things outside of the house was joining clubs. And, um, yep. so I went, I remember just like, I can still remember that first class I did and just being on the mat and just everything kind of quieted for a second. Cause you're on the mat and you're just focusing on your body and you're focusing on breathing. And it was like this pause in this mental struggle I had (laughs) that I was like, Oh my God, like, okay, cool. When I step on this mat, I can just breathe. And my mind shuts down just a tiny bit. (laughs) Yeah. No, I think that's huge. And you know, I've had clients and I'm sure you have too, where they're wrestling with depression and then it's hard. And I, I, like I said, I'm not a stranger to depression. I've, I've had it. I've worked with it myself and seen it, my family and, but there's this work, there's, there's this work to get on the mat or to do something, um, for yourself that puts you in your body, whether it's movement or breathing or meditating. I feel like that's critical for people that are wrestling with depression or anxiety is we have to find a path back to the body, Mm -hmm. whether it's jujitsu or I, I don't know, you know, some of the, not just boxing, but something that has that meditative quality to it as well, like Tai Chi or Qigong. I don't know. That feels really important before you can start, you know, I sometimes think, um, you know, you can talk about how you're feeling in terms of depression or anxiety or all these different things, but it's not enough to just talk about it because you're not, you're still in the realm of the mind, I guess. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I I definitely feel like there's um, a need to kind of get some of the energy out. Yeah. Um, Oh, that's awesome. Get some of the energy out because then you're dealing with just a little less. (laughs) It just takes a little like cap off and lets some of the steam out for a moment. And then you have a little bit of space to then kind of go into the mind and the emotions and all of that. Yeah. How did you get into the mind? Like, so the body definitely cracked a little window. You could let off the steam and then you felt started to feel safe in your mind. How did that begin? Um, Using sound honestly helped so much um, because it gave a focal point with the sound Mm -hmm. um, and using it to really start feeling and diving into like embodiment and, um, I feel like that is so important is to be able to, to not only think about something in your mind, but then to feel it in your body, like get something turned online, let, let your body start to actually feel what it's like to feel that. Cause hmm. a lot of people, especially myself, have never felt like, um, like what it is to just feel peace for a second or hmm. to let the sound help guide you to where are you feeling this? Mm. Um, that definitely helped a lot with the sound to help to pinpoint. And um, sound is also an amazing way to actually open up your mind more. It stimulates like the visual parts of your mind. So it helps 
um, helped me at least um, to open up some of that, uh, the places in my mind where I could go deeper and see the metaphors and kind of start to open up that mental plane where I could start diving into certain things. Yeah. So for people that might not be familiar with working with sound, you know, when you say that, what, what do you mean? What kind of sounds, how does it go? What happens? Yeah. Um, What does that mean? Like how would I start to work with sound if I wanted to, right? um, I would, I would absolutely start just using like nature sounds. Um, find okay. a recording of whatever type of nature sound, whether it's storms or running water or birds or anything, and just start listening to it and just pinpoint one sound when you're listening and just Ooh. focus on that one sound and just listen to it like you've, you're hearing it for the first time. That's a great way to just open your mind up to sound. And then from there, you may continue to listen to nature sounds or crystal bowls or Tibetan bowls or... I mean, honestly, I even just your, your favorite band or your favorite, you know, musician, just listen to them, just feel it, (laughs) just feel it. If it makes you feel an emotion, dive into that emotion and just let it run its course and see what it does and see what it brings to your mind and to your body and just kind of go from there because everyone's experience is going to be different. Um, Mm -hmm. But just giving your yourself time to experience it. Mm-hmm. It, when you say it like that, it's, I can see so clearly how important the body is. Like before you go here, like having some kind of connection to your body and how it's reacting to things is helpful. Yeah. I think especially cause I felt so very un like untethered <laughs> um, yeah. and hazy in the depression, um, finding something that could just ground me yeah. for a moment. Um, so I wasn't all up here and, and confused and, I just needed something to just bring me back down for a moment. Yeah. That's awesome. So then the next phase of your journey, like what started to happen then? Did something call you? Was there a pain point that kind of drove you? Like what, how did it continue from sound healing and, uh, and Thailand? Um, Oh wait, first, before that, I have to ask, what was like your favorite thing about Thailand in terms of anything? And then what did you eat in Thailand that you were like, oh my God, I want to (laughs) know. Um, it was just so simple. Mm. It was, it was quiet. Like it was loud, but quiet in a different way. Like at least the part that I was in, there just wasn't a lot of TVs and and people on their phones and radios and this and constant noise. It was, you know, just people talking. They were talking such like they talk about the ocean and like talk about like the trees because that's what was in front of you, not like the the TV screen or what have you. Which those conversations are great and I love them, but it was just so peaceful and you just walk. You just walked around everywhere. You went, you went to like restaurants they had like hike up to, and it was amazing. Um, the food was great. Um, (laughs) they have this one food that it's actually called like no name because it just never got a name. And it's just like, it's always made kind of different. Um, it's like this, like pastry kind of thing mixed with whatever because it's just like people make it so different but i just love that people were just like yeah fuck it we don't have a name it's just no name i love that that is so awesome so you can go to a restaurant and be like i want the no name or whatever that that was a real thing yeah can i get no name (laughs) oh my god that is my favorite story i love it i love it okay now back to our regularly scheduled programming now tell us your deep soulful things no yeah i would love to know like what then happened because i know there were many more steps that you took um i think it was just continuously just going with my like gut feeling and i I had gone Mm. to so after i did the sound training um and that felt great i think every time i just even though there was always just still depression there, even through the yoga, through the sound, um, there was just always this feeling of like, it's feeling better Mm -hmm. or there's moments that it's felt better. So just keep going. Mm. (laughs) Um, yeah. And I, I remember actually during my, my sound training, I, 
we had to go down to floor. A lot of it was online, but you had to go down um, at the end of it and do like a live session for the instructor, no pressure, right? right. And <laughs> I remember completely shutting down and I freaked out and I left the room and I was crying and I was like, I can't do this. I'm not good at it. I'm awful. I failed. And I remember when I finally, it took me a couple of days to actually get myself to, to go back and do it. But when I did and I did, I was like, there was just, just, just flood of like, just opening of like, oh my God, I did it and I can do it. And I think that was such a big, big moment for me. So sorry about that. We had some technical problems where we stopped recording for a second, but now we're back. And so I think where Shanti was in the story, it was in this moment where long after um, the big Thailand journey and all this, that there was Dharma, Dharma school calling, it sounds like, right? Yeah. And that was kind of always there before or it, it just was, yeah. happened? Um, really? it, uh, it was actually before I went on my yoga training. Um, and it, it was just kind of like always sat in the back of my mind a little bit. Um, yeah. But it was the first time that I really experienced um, being able to share and express what I was feeling in mm. such a safe space. I went mm -hmm. to... Um, it was one of their fire ceremonies and like the share circle or it was like yeah. the circle thing. I forget exactly what it was, but, yep. um, I had no idea what I was going to. <laughs> My friend was just like, Hey, come with me to this thing tonight. And I'm just like, what? And they're like, don't worry about it. Just, just be here at this time or whatever. And I was like, okay, I have nothing to do tonight. Um, I love <laughs> and, it. you're such an adventurous spirit. <laughs> and, um, I went there and, uh, I remember sitting there and like, I remember they opened space and then everyone started sharing and like people were being so real and genuine. And I'm just sitting there like, wow, like, what is this? And <laughs> then I remember they broke us off into like smaller groups of like three or so. And, you know, we pulled a, a tarot card and, you know, we got to share. And I remember the, the two people sharing before me, and I'm sitting there like listening to them, like, wow, like, oh my God. And then like, it came to my share and I, I didn't even think I was really going to open up, but that was, I mean, I, I was crying. I was just so real. And I just, I remember looking into their eyes. I was looking down the whole time as I was sharing. And I remember once I was done, I looked up and I, I just looked into each of their eyes and it was just so open and, and sincere. And just, they were just listening, like, listening like without judgment and they were just hearing me and it just like that still sticks in my mind so much that was the first time I ever really got to express myself and that I allowed myself to express myself because I felt safe mm. and I think that honestly I think maybe that really is what maybe set me down mm. on the journey a bit more because I think I kept hunting for that and you know, mm. hunting for, for people and spaces to have that. And I think it was hard because not everybody can or is meant to hold that kind of space for you. Right. And I think when I would try for that and it was the wrong people or person, it kind of mm. shut me down a little bit more because then I was thinking like, totally. oh, it was just like, it's, that, that was just a, a, a momentary thing in time. Like it's not real, or maybe, maybe I was, I was kidding myself. Maybe they actually didn't care and they wanted me to shut up. And, right. you know, it was that voice playing in my head again and it, you know, it was hard, but I was, I was hunting that still of that safe space. Mm -hmm. And then years later afterwards, I ended up, you know, I was just like, you know, I think, I think it's time for Dharma and then I signed up and yeah, I found that space again and found people and found friends through that. And, you know, now I know I have a place to go. Like, these are the people I can go for that. Like, and I have my friends outside of it who I love them dearly, but they're not that, they're not, they're not meant to hold that kind of space and that's fine. Mm. And I that's think such a good attitude. Mm -hmm. I love that you can have friends that are really deep listeners and can hold that space and then also not because I think it's easy to judge people. I love how you said some people aren't meant to do that. 
but it doesn't take away from their value. I just think that's so insightful. Yeah. Yeah. I know. I think there is this thing about people are yearning to be authentic, but afraid to be authentic. And then send we, tr you know, trust someone and they end up being the wrong kind of person. And I think people start to think, oh, it's me rather than say, oh, that person's not able to hold space for me the way I need it. We just go, oh, it's me. I'm so weird, you know, or whatever in the beginning anyway. Right. We don't realize listening at that level is a skill and you have to want to do it. And it's not everybody's jam. I love, I think that's such an important distinction. Absolutely. And I, I think it's, it's also, um, in, in now having gone through Dharma and learning how to hold space and learning how to listen, mm -hmm. um, being able to be that person for another, like somebody who isn't on the same path and doesn't know how to hold that space you know, it, I think for me is it's also a way for people to kind of see that there is that option. Like I didn't know there was that option until I went to that fire ceremony and I was like, oh, this is actually a thing. So I think just even being that person, you know, showing somebody that it is possible, you know, so even yeah. those friends that aren't meant or at the moment aren't on their own timeline where they're able to do that for you, you being able right. to show that for them is so important because they may never Brilliant. have known. Oh, I love that. It's true because I, I think you don't know what's possible until you see it, yeah. until you see it or experience it. And I, I love the joy that you take. And I see this when you're mentoring in Dharma school or teaching a little mini lesson with a little group about a demo that we're doing like holding that space for others and then watching them light up and seeing those possibilities. Like you do that so beautifully. You create such safe space around you. Like it is a joy to see you inspire students and people around you through so many things, your words, your, your sound, your magic, like you just have a magic to you. It's yeah. beautiful. Yeah. All right, so let's get into the gritty of it. Of all of the things that you experienced, let's say in Dharma school or any other programming like that, what was one of the hardest moments that you faced? And then how did you get over it? I think, I think it would have to be winning the battle against that voice. Oh, say um, more. When did that? Yeah. yeah. Um, Love it. Because that, that would be what always won out. It would tell me, you know, it'd be like, stop, don't try, don't bother. They don't like you. You don't fit in. Like it, it was, it literally just this like loud voice in my head. I mean, it'd wake me up in the middle of the night, like mm -hmm. out of a dead sleep. Yeah. I would just wake up and just be, it would just be this voice telling me all these horrible things about myself. And it would keep me up for hours. Jeez. Like I'd wake up at one o'clock in the morning and I'd spend like hours sitting there hearing all of these horrible things. And that was my whole day, how all the time. Like, how difficult, really? Yeah. It's so, amazing. Okay, continue. I'm sorry. No, you're fine. Yeah, no, it was, that was the hardest thing because that was what would always, you know, I'd, I'd start going and it'd pull me back. I'd start, mm -hmm. I'd pull me back. And it was just this kind of like leash that like depression had me on. It was just like, nope, mm. I got you. Mm. And... I remember the first day and it was just a constant practice, I think like, and I don't even, I can't even say exactly what it was that finally made it change or what have you, but it was just, I think constantly just trying and constantly working on all of those past stories that I had, all the trauma, the, the things that were bringing me down and just constantly working at it. I remember it was actually after I did a sound bath for the first time for Dharma, um, that night I went to bed and somewhere in the middle of the night, I woke up, that voice snapped me awake. And I remember just saying, I did good. And I went back to sleep in like 30 seconds. That was the <laughs> first time I ever had that. <laughs> oh my gosh. What a revelation. Yeah. To be able to call that voice. Yeah. I, I think the, it's, and it's not like it always, I, after that, that every single time the voice came, I won the battle, but yeah. it's been, the battles are shorter yeah. and sometimes I don't have them at all. Sometimes it is that 30 second, you know, quick, you know, I did good. I'm fine. Yeah. Um, I found, I think 
the best practice I've done for myself is during those times that I start to feel shitty about myself and, you know, I hear that voice and I'm like, I'm not good enough. And, um, I try to find something in that moment that I can be proud of. Um, like I, I went skiing for the first time and I wasn't keeping up with everybody else. And, you know, it was taking me longer and I was falling and I was scared and I was timid and all of these things. And usually I would be just like, whatever, I should stop. There's no point. I suck. Like I can't keep up. And Mm -hmm. instead I was like, okay, yes, I see all of that. And I'm not doing as well as everybody else, but I'm really proud of myself because I made it down the bunny hill. I'm really proud of myself because Mm -hmm. I made it down that part. And I just try to take that through the rest of my day, you know, even as simple as like, you know, in the morning, like sometimes I wake up and I'm still kind of a little like blah and like, you know, have Mm -hmm. moment days where I, you know, feel a little down, but I wake up and I get up and like, you know what? I'm really proud of myself because I got up and Mm -hmm. I made myself breakfast and I made myself a coffee and Mm -hmm. good. (laughs) I feel good about that. (laughs) Just taking something out of there because there is something. Yeah. That's brilliant. I love that practice. Like, I think that's something that anyone listening can, can start to do. Mm-hmm. instead of like find the gratitude because we hear that a lot right in spiritual circles but i love what you've said there is to find something that you're proud of about what you've done or who you are mm-hmm. and some find some source of pride in that moment that's genius i love that and i can hear how powerful that is yeah. and it's true i think when you're in a bad place sometimes like i brush my teeth i showered i got dressed for the day like those those little things are not trivial they start us on a path of, of like an uplifted path of feeling good about ourselves. Mm-hmm. So that's, I love that. That is a total takeaway for me that I'm totally going to steal from you. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. Amazing. So yeah. So then how's the battle going? Like, it sounds like you've overcome so much and what's, what's on the horizon now for you? I mean, I, I don't really know, but this has been my, this is, like I've been calling it my yes year. Oh, um, yeah, this is another tool. I love it. The yes year. I love it. Um, beginning of the year, it was like the first, it was actually the first like two full moons of the year I, I had had that. Okay. The first one I did a, a fire ceremony for and I, and I had posted a video about it. I was very vulnerable yeah. with it. Um, but that I was just finally ready to just I just need to let it go. And I, I, I remember saying in it, like my soul can't take not being her anymore. Mm. And that was, you know, wow. this, you know, me, I just, I just, I need to just finally be me and stop letting all of the other things keep me away from that. Mm. And there was a moment where I kind of like, after that hit like a plateau, yeah. Um, where I just felt very empty and I felt like there, I didn't have a fire in me going anymore because mm-hmm. all the things that had been fueling me for so long, you know, e- even the depression, and it was almost like a fuel because I wanted so badly to get out of it right. and the anger and all of these things, I finally let it go. I mm-hmm. like, I think it's so important to finally say yes to something because if you're teetering on the edge there's no way to ever have one you you can't have one or the other because you're just sitting in the middle um so finally saying yes to i am letting this go i need to and i want to and i'm saying yes to that and i finally let it go and there was a a moment there was a, a period of just feeling very empty but in a good way And then the next full moon, I did another fire ceremony. And um, I remember opening sacred space and, you know, turning into each direction. And there wasn't a lot of words that I said for each one, but I just imagined standing there and imagined, you know, serpent and jaguar and hummingbird and all that in each direction, just stepping into me and just embodying that feeling of just being, I am shedding it. I am stepping into my power. I am acknowledging my journey and I am taking flight. This is, I am doing it and just 
giving in and finally accepting that this is me and I am choosing this new path. And I still can feel that in my body, which is why I think like embodiment is so important because Mm. you can then go back and feel it and your body can feel it and your emotions can feel it It all clicks online. Um, And I think that was like such a turning point. And since then I've just been, you know, like saying yes to things, you know, I, I'm, I think it's really important. I think for, at least in my experience is getting out of depression has been saying yes Mm -hmm. and trying new things because it changes what you're doing because what you're doing Mm -hmm. isn't working where you're at sucks. Mm -hmm. (laughs) You can feel it. You know it. You're unhappy. Right. That's what you're doing isn't working. So either you're going to keep doing the same thing and stay there, or you can say yes and try things. And that's, you know, going and taking a class or, you know, reading a different kind of book or, you know, even taking your book and reading it in a different location than you usually do. Mm -hmm. Um, So this has been my yes year and I've been, you know, trying different things. And, um, you know, this year I'm hoping to, you know, start hosting some events and doing stuff like that because that's something I've always wanted to do. So I'm going to give it a try. Um, It feels good to just try. (laughs) It's incredible because I think when you're under the, on the leash of depression, like you said, feeling like trying seems like it's impossible. seems sometimes like a million miles away and you have found a way to make that journey to bridge that gap, you know, and I, and I love that. And I know this might be too personal, but I know a lot of people think some people have an approach towards um, depression, like, oh, I never want to do meds because meds aren't natural or I'll do cannabis because cannabis is natural and it's not pharmaceutical. And then there are some people who are like, I, I want to be able to do it with my own mind, own mind, my own breath, my own skills. And so on that continuum, yeah. you know, how did you find yourself? And not that there's any one right way, but yeah, I, no, you, absolutely. I, um, I remember your speaking thoughts. on this that, um, yeah. I, uh, I remember going to, to therapy and, mm-hmm. um, I had specifically went to this location because they were like a natural pathic, like holistic location. And, mm-hmm. um, I remember I went there about like four times or so, and I got a lot out of it. I definitely, you know, recommend, you know, talking to somebody, um, anybody, whatever, you know. <laughs> right. Anybody talk to somebody about your depression. Yeah, I, I, like getting things <laughs> out vocally. Um, especially if you're like me, where your mind is just constantly chattering and so crazy, like getting Mm. words out, Mm. it's so powerful. Like, even if it doesn't make sense, Mm -hmm. just talk. Um, Mm -hmm. but I remember going to the therapist and again, I got a lot out of it, but I remember she was constantly pushing medication on me. She's like, I want you to be medicated. And I'm like, I'm just crying. Like, I'm just like, I'm just crying. And it, for me, I just, I knew that I did not want to be medicated because Mm -hmm. I was living in such a haze already. Like there were days I would have a hard time distinguishing if I was awake or dreaming Mm. because I was just so foggy already from this depression that I was like, I have such like a tiny little microscopic amount of clarity right now. Yeah. I don't want medication. Right. And I, I knew I could do it as me, that little sliver that was just like believing or at least trying to believe in myself was like, you can do this as you. And I know so many people who take medication and they, they wanted it or they needed it and it works for them and they needed that. Mm -hmm. And that was part of their journey. Mm -hmm. Um, but it wasn't part of mine. Mm -hmm. Um, I mean, Again, I'm, I was kind of just going down it and I said to myself, you know, I'm going to keep trying, but at some point it doesn't, you know, maybe I'll give it a try. But at this moment I was like, that is not what I want. Yeah. That's amazing. Mm -hmm. Uh, There's this little sliver. There's something so powerful about your connection to that little sliver inside of you. That is amazing. Um, And I wonder, you know, what advice would you have for people that maybe, have that little sliver or not that connected to it or like, girl, I don't even have a sliver. (laughs) There's not even a speck of sand in there right now. (laughs) Like, what would you say? (laughs) 
if you're still waking up and you're still breathing, mm. there's a sliver. Even if you don't feel it or see it or anything, yeah. it's there. And as hard as it is to, to try, because mm. I get it, yeah. I was so close to giving up. <laughs> um, there is another side that you can get to. Again, if if it's that shitty, it can also be that good. <laughs> um, and you have to find your way and you're going to find, you're going to try things and it's not going to work for you. And you're going to try other things and it's going to kind of work. Mm -hmm. And you just kind of keep at it and, you know, find, if you can, at least one, one way, one person that you can take a breath with, whether that's getting up in the morning and taking a walk, reading a book, having a coffee, finding a friend you can talk to, um, whatever it is, the mm -hmm. simplest thing, whatever allows you to just take an exhale and breathe for a second, uh, just lean into that a little bit more and find more and more space where you can breathe mm. and relax and find moments that you can feel just a little better because that little better is calling at that sliver. I love that. Like a little bit better is enough. Yeah. Like it, it sounds like I hear that through your whole story, like celebrating those little bit. Yeah. So I, th I think I kept, I, I would knock myself because I just wanted to just, you know, have it right away and just have that epiphany and just be like healed and happy. And yeah. I mean, maybe for somebody out there, that's how it happened. Right. But for me, it was just keep adding another grain of salt to that, you know, just mm. it's like a tiny little grain of salt into that cup. And eventually it just, it starts to fill itself. Oh, that's beautiful. Beautiful. Totally one of my takeaways. Another one of my takeaways is that just a sliver, like it's enough, like that micro moment, that little bit of salt. So, okay. Nice. Before we wrap up, I do have another kind of direction I want to go in because I think yeah, I've heard from clients and, and so many people, even just friends around town that they are afraid if they're wrestling with something like depression or trauma or anxiety or any of the things that, um, or like personality disorder, like there's so many things that they, when they find somebody to talk to, they feel like a burden. That's like one thing that happens. The other thing I hear happen a lot is too, they'll find someone and then they'll like lock and load on that one person and that's it. And then that person eventually burns out in a way. It sounds like when I hear those stories sometimes. So yeah, like what, what are your thoughts on that? Like are, you know, when you, you're like, I can't talk to anybody, what a burn it. And now I'm going to burn out somebody and ah, uh, you know, mm -hmm. because I do think that might be what prevents a lot of people from yeah. ever opening up about it. Mm -hmm. Um, I think, unfortunately, it's a little trial and error. Yeah, that makes it's, sense. You have to just open up and talk to somebody. And yeah. if it ends up being too much, it's too much for them. But maybe it's what you needed. Mm -hmm. And if they've had enough, then they've had enough. And they're going to step back or they're going to step away. Maybe not in the gentlest way. Mm. Because not everybody knows how to do that. Mm -hmm. Um not everyone has the language and the way to really say like, I, I can't handle this right now. Mm -hmm. And as much as it might hurt for somebody to step away and you feel like a burden, they still held space for you for a time. Mm. Yeah. So there are people out there who can continue to hold space for you. And I, I definitely know I was there. I definitely unloaded on people and mm -hmm. them being like, Whoa. And same. Mm -hmm. some of them, left completely and that's fine yeah. and other ones they just needed a break yeah and they're still there yeah. um but you know i think unfortunately like you just never know how people are going to take things and how people are going to handle it right i wish there was an easy way to say this person's going to be great for you right. <laughs> but 
Right. You know, everybody with green eyes is really good listener. So easy. Exactly. Right. Not at all. Not at all. Well, yeah. what about on the other side of the coin? Like if somebody is like a, um, a friend or loves someone that's kind of wrestling with this, what advice would you give them? The ones that are supporting the ones around that might be feeling low. A lot of reassurance, I think. Um, mm. Like if you are trying to be there for them and hold that space. Because I think for me and for people dealing with like depression and anxiety and all of that, they probably have that same voice or one similar that's mm. saying, you know, you're being a burden. You're too much. They don't want to hear it. You're, you're stupid. Mm. Like you're this, you're that. And they're thinking all of these things. Right. And they just need you to, cause like they're, they're assuming all of these things in their head. Mm -hmm. mm. They need you to clarify. That's not what, what you're thinking. <laughs> Tell them it's okay. I can listen it's okay. I hear you. It's okay. Like you're not being too much mm -hmm. like, you know, and just letting them know it's okay. But also mm -hmm. I think, you know, like I said, like if you can't handle it or maybe it's triggering you or whatever it is, mm -hmm. it's okay. Just be, be honest, I mm -hmm. think is the best, best policy because there's going to be so many voices in that person's head. Mm. And just clarify, just reassure. Yeah. That's beautiful. Well, is there anything else that you want to say? You know, like you've got anything other than what we've talked about. There've been so many great takeaways from this, you know, the find a moment to be proud, the say yes, the, um, the little sliver, the little window of, believing in yourself is enough. And so are the little moments of feeling good. It doesn't have to feel amazing. It can feel like a little better and it's enough. Those are some of my takeaways for now, but is there anything else that, that you'd like to say before we wrap it up? Um, that you're not everything lasts forever. Mm -hmm. um, that can include your depression and the moment you're in. I think a, a great lesson I've taken away is just that, you know, things change and go through their cycles. And if you allow yourself to flow with that for just a little bit, and that might be, you know, opportunities coming and saying yes, or um, changing up your routine or what have mm -hmm. you, that change will happen um, mm -hmm. because that's life. And the way you're feeling now doesn't have to be forever. Mm. Mm. I love that. Yes, there's a doorway. Oh, I love it so much. So, so yeah, if you're listening and you're wrestling with any of these things, you can definitely get in touch with con with uh, Shanti and you can contact her um, in a lot of different ways. And the best way right now is at soul happy. Is that right? Where's yep, the best way happy, to reach you? One word um, on uh, Facebook. Uh, the page is kind of new, so it's not too much content right now, but um, you could message me through there. Um, there's, there's a little blue elephant icon. You'll see that. Oh, I love that. I love that. Yeah, because you're going to be working with someone who really understands and can hold really wide space for whatever you're going through. And and she'll always bring a blend of the the sound and the embodiment and the the energetic healing and the shamanic work and, and just so many different modalities that Ashanti works with. So yeah, if you're on the struggle bus, you're not alone. People get you and definitely get in touch with Ashanti. And if you are ever in need of having a sound healer kind of work with you or a group of people, like, the, I mean, we, we hire her to do Naughty Shaman because it's so potent what you offer through sound because it's not just the bowls that come through, you know, it's you, it's your heart, it's your prayers. It's the way the space you hold. And so it's much more than like your average sound healer. So I just want to thank you with a deep reverence and a bow to your beauty and wonder and magic because you're doing good work in the world, gal. And it's such an honor to know you. So thank you so much. Thank you. I mean, I, I can't thank you enough for what going through Dharma has done for me. It's like anybody, like if 
if you're listening to this and you have a calling and that gut's calling you, mm. that's you calling. <laughs> Answer mm. it. It's, Answer it's it. Probably what you need. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. All right, everybody. Well, this is Natalie Carlisle and Ashanti Wood. And sadly, we must leave you. I know you're heartbroken because you could hang out with us all day, but uh, we're going to go say yes to some things. And we hope that you do too. So thank you for tuning in to the Naughty Shaman podcast, where we like to keep the sacred a little bit wild and totally real. Thank you. If you're hearing this message, you've listened to the entire episode. And for that, we are so grateful. Please reach out to us. Let us know what topics you'd like to see covered in our future episodes. Get in touch in the comments because we love to hear from you. And you can reach us on social media.